Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. Welcome back to our uh, continuing uh, energy storage at PNNL webinar series. Uh, have you glad to have you all back uh, if you've been here before? So today our topic is energy storage controls. Uh, and two of my colleagues here at PNNL will be presenting on that. One of the key features we look at. So if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the reliability test lab and how we're getting that data off of systems in terms of what the degradation is, what's the functional state of charge you can operate a lot of these different storage technologies on. And then we've also seen work on how do you, when you have perfect foresight, how do you value and stack benefits of these energy storage systems? And really the, the idea of bringing that together in terms of the physics of the battery with you know, how we want to operate dispatch whenever you actually you have a system ready to go comes down to a control issue and what you can get out of it. So looking forward to this today, um, I'll do quick introductions here, but a few notes. Please, as you go through, um, uh, put your questions in the chat. We will go through the talk and then about the last 15 minutes, we will go through and actually uh, do Q and A and try to answer those questions. So as those come up, please put those in the chat. Also a note on the, uh, the grid storage launch pad, this is in support of the new facility that is starting at PNNL. Um, and if you go to the website, the recordings of this, uh, uh, this webinar and our previous ones are available for you to download. We typically do not provide the slide decks uh, to people. Uh, we can check and see if the, they are accessible, but you are able to access a recording uh, if you want to. So without any further ado, uh, we will get started with the introductions here. So our first speaker today is Diane Baldwin. Um, Diane has worked in the renewable energy field as a power systems engineer. Uh, energy policy analyst, analyst and program administrator. Her focus is on grid interconnection and uh, integration of renewable energy and has experience in wind, solar, small hydro, biomass, and marine energy technologies. Diane has engaged with numerous utilities in the Northwest and with Bonneville Power to deliver substations designs, protection and control schemes and long range planning. As a project manager, she has led innovative demonstrations in demand side technologies, renewable integration, and energy storage. Diane previously worked at the Oregon Department of Energy and was part of the team delivering PacWave, the nation's first grid connected wave energy test facility for Oregon State University. Our second speaker will be Sarman Hanif, who completed his technical work at the technical uh, PhD work at the Technical University of Munich in 2018 and worked as a research associate and research fellow at Toon Create Singapore from 2014 to 2019. Sarman joined PNNL in 2019 and his research is focused on power system economics, load modeling, optimization method and optimization methods. At PNNL, Sarman is actively engaged in our transactive energy systems and use of energy storage systems to improve cost and technical performance of electricity grids. So with that, Diane, if you're ready, we'll let you take off and uh, enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Vince. I trust that everyone can hear me. Welcome to the energy storage webinar focusing on energy storage controls. Glad you're all joining us today. Um, I am going to have my colleague Sarmad running the slideshow here. I'm going to present just for a, an introductory portion, and then we'll hand it off to Sarmad and he'll get into some more concrete examples. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So as um, Vince mentioned, I have uh, worked extensively with utilities in the Northwest, uh, across the United States, and, and some internationally as well on a variety of innovative projects, including energy storage. Um, we have seen through the work that PNNL does under the US Department of Energy 
um, energy storage program engagement with quite a number of different utilities, different sizes, different locations, um, different uh, regulatory environments in in um, in regulated organized markets and and those who are not. And across the board, we're just seeing more and more industry acceptance of energy storage. So we see these systems grid connected in both distribution and transmission systems. Um, we are seeing a lot more hybrid implementations, so renewable generation facilities, um, large scale and small scale, solar and wind predominantly, but other, other renewable technologies as well, uh, implementing those generation facilities with energy storage um, incorporated into the facility design. And uh, increasingly more behind the meter installations at the commercial and industrial level. We see these a lot at um, campuses, hospitals, industrial sites, any sort of campus where availability of power is, you know, a, a real critical part of delivering services or, or meeting business needs. Um, you know, historically, diesel gensets have been the, the go-to resource for assuring um, power availability and increasing resilience, and energy storage is, is sliding in there right alongside, and in some cases, as a, a significant, um, you know, environmental impact um, improvement, incremental improvement in, in providing resiliency benefits. Um, so that's at the more the campus level, and then um, significant uptake in recent years in in residential behind the meter energy storage. Um, resilience concerns uh, are are definitely driving those implementations, and in some parts of the country with organized energy markets that are providing incentives um, for for residential behind the meter energy storage. Uh, we we see those customers participating and and seeing uh, you know a, a decrease in their electric bill every month by by making that resource available. I included some photos here of of uh, installation that PNNL has been um, closely involved with, analyzing and assisting during deployment. So this is a solar and battery system at a relatively small utility, Orcas Power and Light Cooperative, there in San Juan County, Washington. The uh, utility serves about 11,000 customers, and those customers are spread across 20 islands. The entire utility system is served by submarine cables from the mainland, and that power comes from Bonneville Power Administration. So as this utility is looking to control costs, to meet decarbonization objectives of their members, um, and, and to um, offset some um, significant future investments, uh, such as the submarine cable that, that feeds the entire system. Energy storage is, is um, emerging as a, a pretty key part of their strategy. So this system um, we engaged with with uh, the utility and, and did a lot of techno-economic analysis, looking at potential benefit streams um, that that submarine cable deferral is a key one. And now that this system is operational, now we get to move into that phase um, that, that Vince kind of teed up for us where, where we, we look at real-time operations and, and optimizing the control to really, um, to ensure that those benefits that we saw on the front end in design of the system are, are really coming to bear. Next slide, please. So with that greater industry acceptance of energy storage, we're seeing uh, energy storage cropping up in places that maybe we wouldn't have expected just a few years ago, new topologies, new applications. So this presents, of course, some new challenges in the control realm. Uh, that same utility that I was just talking about, Orcas Power and Light Cooperative, their next energy storage project will be an implementation with multiple energy storage technologies at the same site controlled and operated together. So uh, a longer duration uh, energy storage technology, a flow battery and, and a, um, a lithium ion type technology that you know, is typically a shorter duration energy storage asset. So how do those systems work together? How do you optimize the control to achieve those um, system benefits that you're looking for? How do you integrate multiple energy storage systems together in uh, you know, a, a sort of master energy management system? And how does that coordinate with the utilities controls and protection um, and, and their energy management system, distribution management? So there's, there's a lot of layers as these uh, energy storage systems get implemented in, in these you know, sort of emerging applications. 
Um, PNNL has recently engaged with some utilities to evaluate using energy storage uh, as a hybrid with more traditional generation resources. So I, I mentioned that you know wind and solar are looking at energy storage right there alongside at the same installation location, and that's primarily to um, offset any impacts that that new generation source might have on the distribution or transmission system. Now utilities are interested in deploying energy storage alongside more conventional generation next to natural gas plants or next to hydro facilities. Um, why are they interested in doing that? Because those generation resources are being asked to operate in paradigms that are different from what they were originally designed and installed to do. So we have a power system that has a lot more variability and uncertainty in it because of the changing generation mix and changing loads as well as we electrify transportation. So natural gas plants and hydro plants are having um, modes of operation that introduce a lot higher operation and maintenance uh, costs and, and and intervals and energy storage is being explored as a way to to offset some of those those um, impacts on on operation and maintenance costs. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in this presentation. Sarmad has some more details for you on that. Um, microgrids are more and more of interest. Uh, I almost daily have conversations with utilities and inquiries from utilities who want to understand more about microgrids. How can they be implemented? Um, and as I mentioned, Previously, you know that the campus concepts of of having a higher reliability of supply. Many of those campuses are looking uh, at at options to use energy storage in in a microgrid type setting. So so when the grid is down, they can open some automated switches and operate uh, you know without interruption. Overall, the the challenge to the electric grid of transport electrification cannot be understated. <laughs> it is a really significant change in how we will operate the grid, what the load patterns will look like, what our uncertainties will be, and more and more we're seeing energy storage evaluated as a, a key ingredient in providing grid support as we look forward to those higher um, transportation electrification loads. And the last topic that I wanted to mention under this emerging applications umbrella is uh, bringing together energy storage with advanced energy management in buildings. And we, we have a little snapshot here of uh, Vista Utilities in Spokane, Washington. So they've um, recently wrapped up uh, implementing a pilot project for shared energy economy model. And this is uh, a really interesting way of looking at how can the benefits from the installation and operation of energy storage be shared between the utility whose you know, primary objectives are a reliable grid and keeping the costs of delivering power low to their customers. How can those benefits be shared both with the utility and with the end use consumer? So in this case, you know, the, the owners of the buildings. So that was um, again, you know, an interesting collaboration with PNL and the utility, and in this case, uh, you know, the occupants of buildings. And our work um, did show that there are significant benefits um, when the the consumer side uh, is included in that in that calculation, and and more importantly for today's conversation, in the operation and and the controls, the the day to day dispatch, looking at the grid conditions, the the prices in the energy market, the forecasts of temperature, which affects building loads, and optimizing how you charge and discharge that energy system to deliver not only benefit for the utility in the grid, but for those, those end use consumers. Next slide, please. So we really look at energy storage controls uh, in, in the big picture to give us insight into the operation of the energy storage system and and the context in which it's operating which is you know the the conditions on the grid and also the the market um, signals that are are a part of how the the um, overall benefits that the the energy storage system can can provide those are responsive to market signals in many cases as well as grid conditions so we need insights into what is happening today how is that uh, 
align with the planning that we've done for operation in that day, in that month, uh, and and then how are things changing? What what real time adjustments do we need to make? Um, Sarmad will expand on some of these concepts um, as we move ahead in this presentation. Uh, the controls also give us some insurance. So you make a big investment in an energy storage system, you integrate it into operations, and you want to know that the system is performing the way that you expect it to, um, and that if there are any challenges to that performance, how are they affecting the revenues that you're expecting, um, reliability, even safety. So energy storage controls really are pretty critical to, uh, you know, not just a day-to-day -day operation, when do you turn it on, when do you turn it off, but evaluating over time how this uh, asset that's being deployed is delivering the benefits that you're looking for. So, you know, the motivation behind making an investment in energy storage typically starts with evaluating these potential benefit streams. So you do these financial and economic analyses, you overlay those with the technical capabilities, and, and you make some projections. But that operational phase could differ significantly from what you were expecting in the planning phase. So you need the capability to make changes in what you're sensing, what you're operating in your control objectives, even sometimes if, if you have uh, multiple control objectives that you're, that you're trading off between. So you need a capability to make changes and need good information to make those decisions. And, and that's one of the key aspects that, that energy storage brings to the overall value chain. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this slide is is just representing visually what, what I was just describing. So, so you do this upfront analysis, typically techno-economic analysis. You have to consider both you know, the, the technology capabilities as well as the, the economic drivers of the particular utility system. And, and if there is an organized market, what those what those market drivers are, then you implement the system and you look to realize that value that you've designed and you've planned for. And key is to be able to track the specific metrics for delivering that value. Uh, so the energy storage controls is really critical to closing that loop. Um, what did you plan for? What did you implement? And then tracking the performance and making adjustments as needed. So I'm gonna hand it off to Sarmad and he will get us a little bit more down into some detailed examples. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, so um, while Diane has uh, set the scene for um, the need for controls, um, motivation and 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 the, the challenge, uh, what, what now I like to, um, give a little bit of an insight into this uh, this motivation need and challenges as well as uh, what we at PNL um, have been have been doing uh, to tackle these challenges so I'll, I'll start with this uh, real world example um, which demonstrates the the control needs and and the impact on on um, some of the things Diane mentioned regarding the the value um, and how that can be affected during different um, uh, constructions of control as well as construction of values that you see your your battery energy storage systems or in general energy storage systems are designed for. Um, so this is an example of um, uh, a Snohomish PUD uh, energy storage battery energy storage system uh, where where we we basically did a certain use cases and combination of those use cases um, to to show the impact on the value that you may be able to to generate uh, based on different kind of information that is available. So on the on the figure you see um, four cases in principle. One is um, energy arbitrage, um, and the other is energy imbalance. And then there are two other cases which are co-optimizing both of these uh, services. Now there is. Um, from the Doosan grid tech, uh, there is a distributed energy resource optimizer, uh, Dero, and uh, it uses a priority-based ranking to, to schedule charge set charge, charge uh, discharge set points. Um, so since we have two um, uh, services, arbitrage and energy imbalance, we have uh, two cases of their co-optimization where one, uh, case one uh, in co-optimization uh, prioritizes um, 
energy imbalance and uh, case two prioritizes energy arbitrage. So what we basically compare in this in this exercise was um, we generated value streams from um, both um, Dero and our in-house uh, tool, uh, which was presented by um, our uh, our industry acceptance lead uh, Divu in our previous talks, uh, which also considers uh, mathematical analytical optimization strategies. And then within that optimization strategies, essentially we considered two scenarios where different information was fed to the optimization. So uh, AP and AM you see in the slides in case one, those are um, basically AP was when AM, sorry, I'll start with AM. AM is when you have a battery energy system model, which can, which can represent the uh, non-linearities in state of charge uh, more accurately. And in a peak scenario, basically what, what we are also assuming is that the price which you forecast for optimizing these services, these, these are also known in, in, uh, in perfect. Um, so what you see in all of these four cases uh, are that with the inclusion of an improved state of charge model, as well as inclusion of a little bit of better knowledge on price forecast, your value estimation improves. And conversely, what you could see is if you don't include them, you would basically be losing out on, on certain value streams or value estimations from your battery energy storage systems. So the, so the underlying theme is understanding what could go wrong in planning and operating your battery energy storage system has a big impact on um, on on the the value you can extract from the battery energy storage system, and this is where the the controls uh, basically kick in. Um, now, while we understand that under uh, categorizing and characterizing what could go wrong is is important. Now this is very challenging for the for the battery energy storage systems, as in any new asset that is being installed in the grid. But we, we we're going to make a case where battery energy storage systems are especially energy storage systems, especially, are more um, of a special case, and why why there are so so many challenges associated with them. So first, uh, we wanted we want we would like to present is um, energy storage systems can vary not in terms of their sizes and, and types, they also vary in terms of where you place in the grid. And this diversification is a, is a challenge. First of all, um, energy storage systems would be placed in behind the meter uh, to, to control some of the consumer um, uh, energy demands. It could be also uh, a utility scale energy storage could also be connected um, at the distribution feeder level where it can provide uh, some resilient support, outage management, or um, now more advanced applications, some, some, some sort of voltage um, relaxation and, and voltage hosting capacities of, of uh, uh, improving hosting capacity of other renewable energy uh, generations. And at the same time, with wholesale markets also allowing some sort of uh, distributed energy resources to participate in the wholesale market, their interaction um, can also be quantified as some, some, something which is directly uh, competing with the transmission resource assets uh, in the wholesale market. So this integration, a uh, wide variety of integration options uh, basically present, um, present a challenge. And now this is in terms of the power system integration of energy storage systems. Now this slide, sort of drills down a little bit of what could be the issues specific to the energy storage problem in power grids. So for example, first is um, the dimension of energy storage system and how it impacts the whole grid in terms of space. So for example, energy storage system might be placed behind the meter and distribution grid, but if it's participating in the bulk, bulk system or wholesale market, uh, changes in perceiving how the battery energy storage system uh, or energy storage system uh, operates, it, it impacts the whole grid. And, and not only this, the space dimension associated uh, with this challenge, there is also a time dimension, which is, um, which is uh, the characteristics of energy storage system where a decision you take at a certain time, it impacts the, 
uh, the the storage in in also the uh, the future time intervals so really it's it's like a memory effect which basically uh, captures what what you did in the past and impacts what you're going to do in the in the in the present and future so it limits and that's that's uh, that's the case with the uh, energy storage system because it has finite capacity and um, capacity is linked with the uh, with how much uh, power uh, you you inject um, in the grid now um, now after presenting these challenges um, i'd like to present a controls framework so to say um, what we've we've developed at PNNL, and there are many and uh, many control frameworks in terms of uh, different applications that um, that that we we engage in. But but the underlying theme, what we are uh, what we are um, presenting here, is that there are two stages uh, which which can um, which can um, mitigate these uh, these challenges that that uh, that exist with integration of energy storage systems and controlling them efficiently. Um, the two stages are you, in order to allow the storage to respond in real time to the changing conditions, um, what basically you would need to do is you would need to plan for uh, for allowing it to change into real time. So really two stages, planning ahead, which considers possibilities, and then in real time, you're responding to the actual events because uh, you have left uh, certain capabilities to be exercised in real time. Now, now this has a very, if you notice, this has a very nice resemblance to the the current power grid um, operations too, where in the wholesale market, you have an interplay of uh, a day ahead and real time market. There is also future. Uh, there's also like hedging rights, which are which are done in very long time ahead. But just for example, we we can we can see that in in do, in wholesale day ahead in real time markets, you see the same pattern where where the participants are allowed to uh, to uh, to plan and and provide information on how they how they are thinking of um, of using their assets in the future, and the market allows certain uh, certain capacity to be exercised. And in real time, they're also provided an opportunity based on changing conditions um, to, to react uh, to real time conditions. Now, from, from the control framework that I'm presenting here, what we're gonna show next is that uh, during certain applications, we showed that such a control framework can, can allow for improvements in um, in extracting the value as perceived in the valuation exercises and and the uh, and if you would not have uh, applied let's say at these two stages uh, two stage control framework you would have uh, you would have had a, a reduction a considerable reduction in your in your uh, valuation so one of the examples we'll show it would be for the reg regulation revenue that um, that was planned um, and in, in in not planning and adjusting in real time using the using the two stage control framework, uh, we we exper we experienced an eighty eight percent reduction in the revenues. And then another example would be on the arbitrage, uh, where the forecast of price basically, um, if 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 not uh, adjusted in real time based on the uh, based on the availability of new information in real time market, uh, also reduced the uh, revenue by by sixty eight percent, and really these two uh, examples are also shown as as um, as a demonstration of what could go wrong both internal and external to the energy storage systems. So uh, the reg regulation revenue example uh, use string availability of of large scale energy, battery energy storage system as something which can go wrong internally, and. At the same time, uh, the price, arb the arbitrage example demonstrates what could go wrong external to the energy storage system, where the price forecast um, was the variable uh, which was manipulated. So I'm going to drill, give you a little bit of, of sense of how how an arbitrage, uh, energy, uh, battery controls for energy arbitrage um, uh, was implemented in this stage in this uh, framework. So the figure on the on the left shows planning of energy storage using a mathematical technique called robust optimization um, in, in participating in the day ahead market where uh, where the the charging and discharging was basically uh, scheduled 
so that you take advantage of higher prices to sell energy um, and in order to sell that energy you would need to to charge at the lower prices consider like relatively lower prices um, now what you see is that um, in real while the real time prices arrive um, the the battery energy storage system uh, adjusts its charge discharge um, um, say, uh, charge discharge schedule um, to 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 uh, to account for the changes in condition, and on the extreme right um, graph um, bar chart, you will see um, there are four cases essentially, which which is which are trying to demonstrate um, what basically different values for for one day of optimization for the for the proof of concept we're showing um, achieve, was were, were achieved. So, for example, if you assumed a perfect forecast. Um, you are estimating uh, something around $38. And now as you start relaxing the assumptions on the price forecast, which is the primal uh, uh, condition for the arbitrage, you start seeing reduction in from, from that uh, perfect, um, from that value. For example, if, um, if you just would act on your day ahead price, which of course would, would change in real time, uh, and in real time you won't adjust, uh, you, you saw uh, the highest reduction. And then the values due to our control stage framework could, are shown to improve as you start increasing capabilities of, of, of your battery energy storage to uh, change its control uh, during real time. Um, and of course, um, the maximum improvement was when, when both uh, for the planning stage, that is the day ahead, uh, day ahead uh, stage, um, you uh, accounted for um, for changes in real time, and as well as you you reacted to the real time adjustment. Now, the next example is is a little detailed one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna dive a little deeper into um, uh, the actual experiment that we performed. So this is an experiment of a battery energy storage system with three strings assumed um, with different capacities. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to participate or they're trying to control for participating in the uh, regulation market. So they were, they were again fitting this into our control stage framework. We had two, uh, two stages in our day ahead planning, what based on the statistical information um, and the probability of failure for the string, we, we um, the optimization. Um, the optimization um, algorithm was was fitted with a string failure of one string uh, around hour 10. Now, in the real time adjustment, um, of course, in real time operation, string may or may not fail. And string one um, basically ended up failing at hour 13, which is different than what um, the optimization uh, optimization algorithm forecasting string failure assumed and as well as string one failing string two also failed around hour 22 and but since uh, we we uh, we were demonstrating the capabilities for in real time to adjust with the availability of information um, we were able to 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 capture how much regulation we could provide in real time based on how much capacity that was contracted in um, in, in 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 the planning stage and this slide presents um, certain um, scenarios which 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 demonstrates um, the relevance of two-stage control framework in terms of improving your um, your value and uh, scenario one um, is the base case scenario where um, where you do not perform any planning and real-time adjustment um, for for the for the battery energy storage system participating in regulation market while in scenario two you only adjust for real time and scenario three, you do plan, but you do not adjust for real time. And scenario four is the is the, the full extent of the uh, exercise uh, which we are uh, which we are trying to demonstrate through our control stage uh, framework, in which you both plan for the string failure as well as you you uh, you perform adjustment in real time. And and the point now, which I would like to which I, which I would like to make is um, for the storage system not considering planning and real-time adjustment, considerable uh, reduction in, uh, in, the, in the value that you perceive 
uh, your battery providing a service such as regulation regula uh, regulation um, would be would be observed. Um, so now we, we, we're going to shift uh, a little bit, and we're going to present some of the some of the applications and tools that 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 came out of uh, of these uh, control stage framework and and the and the and the general controls philosophy that we've been working on. Um, this example is um, was a, was a collaborative work uh, done with um, with the Eugene Water Electric Board where where they had um, two uh, f approximately 50 megawatt Francis turbines. And an idea of co-locating the conventional generation asset, as, as Diane explained, with the energy storage to improve uh, or extend um, the life of conventional asset as, as, as um, those are being changed, as the power grid operations are changing. Um, so what we, what we sort of looked at was if, if the energy storage based on um, the characteristic of storage system could be operated, which is finite capacity, but higher ramp up and down, um, uh, ramp up and down capabilities as compared to the, um, the hydro power, Francis turbines, it can, uh, it can considerably uh, reduce the damages for the, for the Francis turbine, um, damages in terms of wear and tear and fatigue of the, of the, of the turbine. But of course, what we what we, we sort of did like a sensitivity analysis of this control framework in terms of how much how much damages you could um, uh, you could reduce, and and you see sort of like a Pareto front or sort of like a uh, like a like an optimal point where the required power and, and capacity uh, would 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 have, would basically get you the maximum uh, benefit in terms of damage reduction. Um, uh, this is just a, this is just like a like an overview of the work. Um, one of our colleague Bilal Bilal Bhatti uh, led this work, and and there's a report you could you could view. And and what what really this shows is like um, that controls framework could be basically interchangeable. So with the same philosophy, you could basically interchange and, and place it in different environments and, and try to, based on the application, you, you try to, you can work around a, a strategy to, to operate the, uh, because it's so flexible, you can operate the, the storage to, to fit that application. Um, we're working also um, um, on extending this, um, and there could be there could be multiple extensions. Some are listed here, um, so which uh, we didn't test the, the the full control stage framework in terms of the uh, planning stage. We we plan based on some rules, um, but we are also thinking of expanding that. Um, we are also thinking of expanding some of the uh, some of the models related to the conventional generation asset and incorporate real time or. Um, Real life, uh, more uh, real life constraints such as fork licensing, environmental constraint, and 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 as um, um, as as shown earlier uh, with in the in the analytics uh, talk by by Divu, it's very important to 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 capture these capabilities of the application in terms of a usable tool, and that's also uh, that's also one of the the future works um, we are thinking. So now, before um, so that's the that's the last. Um, Example that I'm I'm going to present in terms of uh, reusability of the controls, uh, testing of the controls, and evaluation of the controls. Um, so we've been we've been looking into packaging all the control stage framework that we've been developing in terms of a usable tool. It's 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 still in an in an earlier stage uh, where the goal is to to provide a platform. Um, to the to the users to to program their tools direct program their controls directly and also uh, provide them guidance to program the, their to uh, their controls so that they could they could they could evaluate how they're planned and 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 real time um, operations uh, re reaches the value they expect and value they extract of the out of the out of their energy storage system. Um, these are just some of the. I mean, I presented few, but but, but at PNNL we have many more um, control capabilities. I presented a framework, but but definitely uh, uh, what at PNNL we have done is we have we have we have we have, we have done much many more uh, algorithms uh, 
algorithmic advancement also in terms of the controls because the framework allows you to 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 um, to program certain applications as a planning problem and also uh, certain application as the as the as the real time adjustment. For example, uh, we've also looked into model predictive control, um, rule based control. Um, we have also identified few uh, few interesting cases of uh, including um, uncertainties in in terms of scenarios and. Um, and then both in terms of uh, averting the risk and and and, and um, providing a robust control. Um, lately, there has also been um, uh, some some more advancement in terms of the learning of the control based on advanced uh, uh, advanced algorithms such as um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And and um, and and of course, as the technologies are getting uh, placed together. We are also investigating uh, what would be the best strategies for, for for doing a hybrid control strategies, and and not just in terms of the the battery energy storage system. Uh, the figure on the right also uh, demonstrates that uh, and and reinforces what Diane was mentioning that um, any type of storage, uh, the models for the storage and how to include them in the control capabilities that has that that are also ongoing, um, um, and yeah, with this, um, I'll just. I'll just uh, go over um, the key points that we uh, that we discussed. Um, first, first of all, um, as Diane set the scene, what we could we could uh, we could say is that controls um, um, are, are really used as a as a as a as a tuning knob to deliver benefits for the for the for the for the storage uh, owners. Um, and how do you how do you achieve that benefit? Is by keeping in mind uh, who. Um, uh, is the beneficiary who owns the uh, storage system, and at the same time, where uh, where it sits in the in the power system. Now, uh, planning um, is and control frameworks are are all good, but um, the the most important piece is then validating how it operates in the real world environment, um, so that it can provide the insurance that Diane mentioned. Um, um, so for the for the ESS owners to to realize the benefits. Now, um, the framework that we discussed today um, uh, necessitates that we need both planning and real-time adjustments um, to to counter uh, the challenges associated with storage integration in the grid, and 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 to develop a comprehensive, and 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 really robust control. Uh, one of the challenges that we that we highlighted was the the memory effect um, for energy storage systems, and that's uh, and and that's. For battery energy storage system, due to its chemistry, or for for pump hydro, or for matter of fact, any energy storage system, uh, those are, needs to be accounted for. And then, what what basically um, what we also would like to, to to say is that controls in terms uh, is a generic concept which basically necessitates that. Um, you you may need to provide several control or test or or propose several alternative control approaches, and they all could be valid, um, because it really depends. As I as we as we mentioned, it depends on 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 different application, the algorithms you adopt, and the the controls in real time that you that you implement, the infrastructure that you have available within the within the uh, within the framework or utility realm that it's placed. And uh, and the really the the uh, the the prudent approach would be the to compare uh, those different alternatives first at a at a at a valuation stage at a high level stage, uh, so that you when you commit to the uh, to the controls and operate and, and place the battery with with certain functionalities, it it it, it provides you the benefits that um, that you that you um, that you perceived. Now. Um, Another another concept that we didn't really touch, but it should be apparent um, from the discussion. Uh, we would we would hope that is um, that you you may need you may need to do a lot of uh, uh, complex analytics and algorithm to to address the challenges that are associated with integrating energy storage system. But on the on the actual implementation of the controls when it's integrated in the system. Um, it would really be depending upon how simple it is. It would really get very, very attractive for the for the folks implementing the, those control and 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 realizing those control. So uh, what we would like to say is that simplicity 
of of the proposed control in 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 implementation implementing it in the in the actual system is the key and then what i would like to close uh, our talk with is um uh, what controls can and cannot do of course it depends on the availability of the infrastructure that is uh, that is existing in the power grids but these new control types these new frameworks that may also allow investment decisions of upgrading the infrastructure so they can really be seen as as a guiding tool for the for the future um, investment uh, so that maximum value of energy storage uh, systems can be uh, can be extracted um, so with this i i come to the end of uh, our slides um, I would like to thank the Office of Electricity, Dr. Imre, um, and Washington and Department of Commerce and Clean Energy Fund because most of the work uh, that we presented today um, was, was taken from it. And with this, um, I'll come to the end of my uh, presentation. And, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarman. Yeah, we do we have had questions come in. I For those in the audience, if you still have a question, that you'd like to get in, I would encourage you to put that in now. Uh, but let me start off with some of the ones. Um, there was one that said you just had recently mentioned a, um, a memory effect um, in this system. And how, how does that apply to like lithium ion battery systems or how does that relate to like uh, kind of the chemistry? Right, I can, I can, ta I can, take, the, I can take a stab at it and then, um, then you can you can chime in so so the memory effect really what we what we meant was um this um this finite capacity that any storage system fundamentally uh, exhibits um for the controls we used to we we are used to uh, developing state of charge models and there have there have been numerous um work by by uh, by pnnl in characterizing characterizing the state of charge depending upon the chemistry um of the of the storage system um and and um and just just as a characteristics um what we found is um lithium ion um uh, the memory effect for lithium ion which is state of charge which is it's much more dynamics dynamic than the, the flow based uh, chemistry um but uh, eventually um for the control frameworks, we 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 sort of uh, characterize this as an as a change in um, storage uh, state of charge as the change in uh, the power uh, is uh, is um, is injected or, or or taken out from the grid. Is that yeah? yeah. I ho hope that answers. So, Vince, I think you're muted. I am. Thank you for that. So Diane, I think uh, there was a question for you when you came in when you were talking about some of these projects uh, that we've supported uh, over there. It really kind of is what what is the test and measurement re needs for these projects, you know, and what is the safety? What el what all goes into trying to make these successful? And can you expand a little bit on, you know, kind of what's behind the scenes before you actually get this system up and operational? Sure, I'm happy to take a swing at that. So in the projects that I highlighted today, uh, you know, I mentioned that we have this upfront role in terms of planning and, and figuring out what benefits are going to be and then and then working together with the utility through the, the implementation. As those energy storage systems are sited and going through commissioning and, and then fully grid connected, there's a series of test services that we recommend be be implemented. Um, in some cases, PNNL researchers are, are implementing them directly. In, in other situations, the, the owner of the energy storage system might be performing that themselves is fairly unusual or, or finding a contractor. But the, the first step is essentially getting a baseline. You know, how, how does this system work? Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, charge it we're going to look at you know what's the rate of charge what's the maximum charge how long can it hold that charge 
Um, and then we're looking at, yeah, yeah, just sort of putting it through its paces and, and getting a baseline. And uh, sometimes you you uncover some challenges, meaning, you know, it's it's not really operating the way it should, according to the owner's manual, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, and, and those are opportunities to engage with the energy storage system vendor right up front. You know, there could have been a a challenge in manufacturing, there could have been some damage in shipping, there could be something um, environmentally, you know, with the, the housing uh, of the energy storage system that is affecting temperatures. You know, there's a lot of reasons why at, at, the, at the, the very beginning, when, you know, you've just unwrapped this shiny new energy storage system, that, that it might not be quite performing the way that you would expect. And it's really important to get those issues addressed right up front. And then it's important to have a baseline as you look at the operation of your system over time. Um, part of how we project and plan for benefits is modeling and then later, you know, through the controls work, validating what the um, performance of the battery is likely to be over time. And you need a baseline in order to assess that. So those you know steps of of putting the battery through its paces um, are are really important at, at the very outset of the project. Um, uh, some of those tests are different depending on what use cases. You know what what are the the functions? What are the services that you're looking to get out of this particular energy storage system? Um, so so there's few aspects of that upfront testing that are uniform across all projects and then there are some aspects of it that are that are customized for for the services that are being performed all right thank you uh another question that came in um here um let's see uh does pnnl have resources for dc dc converter specs inverter specs or the EMS BMS specs to ensure the whole system comes together. So as you start looking at that, you know, are there guidelines for how to how to bring that all together? And do we have that? So I, I can I can take a stab at it. Um, so um, I I have not directly worked at um, at defining those specs on um, on um, on what what should be the the optimal configuration if i'm understanding the 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 question of uh, because it the, the battery uh, energy storage system is is much much more complicated than just charge discharge there is a there is a there is a dc to dc then there is a dc to ac if you're integrating into the grid um, uh, processes um, so there is there is from the technological side there is um, there is certainly work and 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 I can I can point you towards those work of at PNNL um, in in defining the um, and testing the the these configuration but for the controls um, I'll bring it back to the the questions uh, the 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 uh, the framework um, we we sort of we sort of characterize performances. Definitely, we sort of characterize performances of those systems and 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 represent them in the the operational and the planning model for the for the storage system, and and uh, how you do it is through through identification of the efficiencies of at different stages of these converters as as the as the power um, as the power goes through them, and then um, and then there has been um, a series of catalog work that we've done. Uh, we have cataloged. There's a series of work we have where we have cataloged the the efficiency experience or, or over different um, uh, utility scale uh, energy storage systems. And and um and and uh, and again um uh, there is there is work um, in terms of uh, efficiency characterizes characterization from the control side, but on the on the uh, on the techno techno technology maturing or testing side, there definitely also has been work on on actual implementation of those of uh, of those converter systems and and how they how they should be uh, connected to the uh, to the storage. Okay, thank you. We had another question come in. You know, we focused on the controls for controlling the battery. But have you seen instances where fluctuations in the controls uh, may impact like the battery life? You know, just in kind of the experience from demonstrations or or anything where 
uh, or there are requirements that go on the controls to help uh, prevent that? Right. I, I think this is a very good question. And that's probably which started this whole journey of, of, uh, of what could go wrong. Um, and, 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 and a little, um, and this was, this was, uh, this was prior to, uh, when I joined the lab, but I definitely have the reports and I've read them, um, uh, where, um, there were different testing of different control signals that were performed at one of the, one of the utilities. And there were numerous factors where the, the 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 storage system battery energy storage system was not performing as it was expected the prime factor uh, was uh, the failure of the strings and and how the bms uh, was was programmed to to behave in that scenario um, so this may not directly be the fluctuations of controls but it may very well be um, inaccuracy of interpretation of the control signals and how the battery behaves. And then it may end up driving the battery to certain regions where, where the chances, uh, there is inherent chances of string failure, but also uh, it may reach to the, the limits where, where the controls were not uh, behaving uh, expectedly. Um, so yeah, so these are, I mean, this is one, uh this this is a direct experience which which i have i have come across um yeah i mean if if uh, if there is uh if if there are others from the from the audience if 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 any interesting um phenomena that you you have encountered within particular uh, storage that uh, that that you own or you you've, you've you've known to um to to have caused um, i mean we we love to hear about that too and um yeah, that's <laughs> that's uh, that's something. All right. Well, well, we're running out of time. I'll try to do one more here. You'd mentioned Storeflex, and there an opportunity to that that may be an open source. This framework that you've developed. Do you envision that to be a self-contained control system, or is this one to help train like commercial uh, control systems? Or both, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, do, um, can I, I just I, what, what what do you envision? I mean, that system being looked like, and maybe when would it be available? Yeah, I can I can I can take a stab at it. Um, so 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 I think this is a this is more like um like outreach questions in terms of um, how do you package the control? Um, we, as a researchers, we love to make things open source um, because, because then it's, it's widely available for research community, but, but we understand this is also um, a question in terms of as, as the applications get quite diverse and applications get quite specific at the same time um, in terms of their uh, diversity of control framework, we, 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 we think the best strategy definitely is validating the controls, working with the, with the utility partners more intimately, uh, testing it, um, making it robust um, before, before we, 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 do, we provide the full development, uh, full, fully, uh, implement it. Um, so, so I think a, a path would be um, to to first test within the uh, the certain application that was designed for, and then making it more general, and then and then making it uh, making it an open source uh, as a public release. Um, but that's yeah, that's coming from um, from someone who, who who likes to to do like you know like more on the development side. But I love to hear what what. Uh, uh, what what, uh, what what Diane has in terms of because she has much more experience in terms of outreach and, and management of these these type of uh, tools or or methods. Well, I'll just keep it short and sweet and say you know we we need to deliver what the industry can can uptake um, and so I, I think that's that's really the the next step in in our development of this approach. Um, you know we certainly have shown the controls capability. We've shown a pretty promising techno-economic uh, assessment. And so that, you know, when, when we talk about implementation, uh, you know, making that next step, um, you know, be accessible to as many of the interested utility partners, that that's really our goal. 
there, I'm off mute again. Well, thank you both. I know we're a little bit over, but um, I did want to point out if you we did not weren't able to get to everyone's questions, uh, but Sarman, Diane, and myself are available. If you go to pmnl.gov uh, and search our names, you will get our emails and feel free to reach out to us. I did want to uh, thank you again for all your uh, time today, listening to it. I do want to highlight that um, July 28th, our next webinar series will be focused on hydrogen energy storage. Uh, we've, there's a lot of interest in that as a seasonal storage asset. And Jamie Holiday is going to be presenting on that. So with that, and then we have August 11th talking about exp uh, expansion planning uh, with energy storage. Drew will be talking on that. And then uh, on August 25th, Emily uh, will be talking about uh, machine learning and how that plays into the development of uh, energy storage systems. So please join us uh, for those webinars. And thank you again for your time. Thank you.